Welcome to the This Is Horror Podcast. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson. Today we're going to be reconvening with John Skip for part two of our interview. If you missed the first part, then you're going to have to head back to episode 96, where we spoke to John about Fungasm Press, the art of horrible people, and we got into a lot of detail on clowns and why so many people fear them. So it's a a really fascinating conversation and one I think you'll get an awful lot of value out of. Before we delve back into part two with John, quick word from our sponsors. Journey with some of the most accomplished authors of our time as they reveal nightmares from which you may never awake. Dread, a head full of bad dreams, travels the dark passageways of the mind with 20 masters of horror, including Ray Gordon, John Everson, William Mickley, Jonathan Mayberry, and many more. Dread is new, innovative, and 100% reader-selected volume of horror. Fill your head with a lifetime of bad dreams in Dread. Available at booksellers worldwide. Get more info at graymatterpress.com. Crystal Lake Publishing and Mark Sheldon are proud to present Sarah Killian, a 30-year-old, foul-mouthed, mean-spirited single woman. Also, she's a professional serial killer. In his crime fiction thriller novel with a twisted sense of humor, Sarah works for them, Trusted Hierarchy of Everyday Murderers, a secret organization of murderers for hire. So if you're looking for a strong female lead in a book similar to the best of Dean Koontz and Jay Conrath, then look no further than Sarah Killian, Serial Killer for Hire, out July 29th. Okay, so there it is. I always pause when I record these intros after the sponsors, even though I know I'm adding in an audio clip with Bob Pastorella. Not quite sure why I do that, but seems respectful. Anyway, enough of me blabbering on. I've got an interview with John Skip. He's a New York Times bestselling author. He's a zombie godfather. Apparently, he's an all-around renaissance mutant. He's a musical pornographer. He's a lot of things. Let's do it. Part two of Mr. John Skip. And now for a horror interview. So you were speaking before about violence within films, specifically talking about the later Universal Soldier films. (laughs) And... In terms of that and choreographing violence, I thought that led us quite nicely into your Lit Reactor course, the yes. choreography of violence, which starts at time of recording in a couple of days. Yes. So to begin with, who is the course for? And conversely, who isn't the course for? I would say the course is for anybody who... Um, is having problems understanding or negotiating uh, action sequences in their stories. By this I mean uh, chase scenes, fight scenes, escape scenes, uh, death scenes, uh, any place where uh, where physicality becomes a real issue. Um, because a lot of people don't know how to write those kinds of scenes. And uh, so they'll they'll build these deep imaginative worlds full of uh, uh, fascinating characters and, and uh, uh, socio-political conflicts and uh, domestic issues and uh, sense of wonderful sense of place and uh, perhaps even important moral themes to address. And then they'll get to their big thrill pack conclusion and it will just uh, fizzle and, uh, and, you know, kind of droop to the floor. And it's like, man, you built all the way up to this but you can't pay it off. And there are very specific tricks to being able to pay off uh, violence in, in, a, uh, in a written sequence um, that I can help you learn. And that's why I teach the class. And uh, this would be a class that was not for the plumbers union, unless, <laughs> unless they secretly also wish to write violent fiction. <laughs> What are some of the amateur mistakes that you see in terms of writing a fight scene? Okay, um, I set up these uh, 
these little mini lectures or discussions uh, on the very first day of the class, and I talk about what I, I, I see as the psychic speed bumps and sandbags are two things that I talk about. Sandbags are uh, superfluous words or images or uh, uh, flashbacks in the middle of an action sequence that uh, just weigh the uh, the momentum down. Do you ever read the Harrison Bergeron, uh, uh, the, the Kurt Vonnegut story, Harrison Bergeron? I have not, no. No, I haven't. It, it's, it's my favorite short story by anyone ever. And uh, it opened with a guy named Harrison Bergeron. He's trying to watch television, but uh, the government has implanted all these little... Uh, noisemakers in his head that go off in random sequences really loud between his ears so he can never like gather a, a coherent thought but he's watching the television and on the television a couple of ballet dancers are dancing ballet but they have these enormous sandbags strapped to them so that they can barely move and this is how the government has equalized everybody if you're too smart they put bells in your head so you'll be distracted and if you're too good a dancer they'll strap sandbags to you um <laughs> And if you try to take them off, they'll machine gun you and put on another show. And no, I never saw a military coup. So anyway, uh, my point being that uh, it's really fucking hard to dance with sandbags on. And so one of the things that you want to do when you're writing an action scene is strip off everything that gets in the way so that everything that happens in the action scene uh, pertains strictly to the momentum of the second by second ticking by uh, that's happening. And... Um, you know, flashbacks, uh, I'm doing this for you, my little brother who died. If that shit wasn't already set up before the action scene happened, uh, then you tell us about it later. But you don't bring it up in the middle of the action scene because that's just one more dumb thing in the way. Uh, again, as a guy who, who saw people die when he was a kid, um, watching the ways that people bullshit their way through through violent sequences, uh, um can can be kind of amusing. Um, you know, Hollywood very rarely depicts death accurately to the point where, yeah, if, if you see Hollywood dead bodies and then see real dead bodies, real dead bodies look boring. Uh, and that's just the most horrible kind of soul leeching recognition you can have. But there's something about getting it right that has genuine power. And barring that, there's something about getting it really entertaining that uh, has its own genuine power. And, and a lot of times you got to determine um, what kind of violence you're doing. Are, are you doing uh, fun violence or are you doing uh, uh, violence that counts, that, that, that hurts, that, uh, that has the impact that real violence has? Um, I'm not making a moral judgment. I'm just saying uh, you should know what kind you're doing and you should know how to dial it. And those are some of the things that I, I, I talk about in the class. So it's kind of like a confrontation of conflict from the writer's perspective. Well, you know, basically the students come in with the stories that they're, that they're telling. And then we look at what they're doing and go, okay, so here's how you've handled uh, uh, your, your violent sequence. I can see from the story what your intent is in the context of the story. Um, so where are you hitting it and where are you missing it? A lot of times there are a lot of words in the way. A lot of times there's, uh, there's flinching. We, we, we come up on the moment and then we don't want to quite face it. So we flinch and our words flinch with us. And, uh, if you don't flinch on them and you follow them through, uh, they're going to probably hurt her. You, you, you can, uh, or, you know, or pay off deeper and, uh, yeah, there's just a lot of, of very natural reactions that people have to confronting this kind of scene. And some people, like, you know, they'll go for it, um, but they don't understand the physics of the situation. They, they don't understand how fast a bullet travels or, or, um, or how many blows to the face you can take before you're actually down, which is not that many. You know, uh, uh, fights where people, like, punch each other square in the head uh, uh, 50 times. That shit don't happen. You watch a heavyweight bout. Um, the second somebody really clearly connects super hard, that guy's like, you know, if he's not down, he's like, at, he's running at fifty percent. He's a staggering pain machine at that point. Yeah, there, there's just a lot of places. You know, if, if you fire a bullet at the front of a car and the car explodes, 
either you've got a special rocket bullet or you're just talking out your ass. Are you taking that from a story you've actually read then? <laughs> oh, oh man, you, you know, people do all kinds of stuff. But um, what I love about the class is that everybody comes, A, crazily thinking that I might know something that could help them, and B, really wanting to learn how to do this. There, there are very few people who take this class that, that don't walk in really trying to understand how this shit works because they've, they've been struggling with it and they, they want some answers. And I feel like usually people come out of there with a lot of, of answers or ways of thinking about it that, that are useful to them. And uh, yeah, I really love teaching this class and I really love how happy the writers come out of it so often just going, man, thank you. This was great. And, and again, not just me, but learning with each other and uh, analyzing each other's stories and, and, and trying to figure it out together. Uh, if you can whip up, if you have a bunch of people who are already excited to be there and then you just keep shit uh, whipped up and flying and, and, uh, and, and clear headed and honest, then uh, everybody's going to have a pretty fucking good time. And if you could recommend two books that get violent spot on, which would they be? I'm just going to stick with, uh, um, William Goldman, the guy who wrote Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and Marathon Man and uh, um, uh, God, uh, Pr Princess Bride, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, vastly varied career. But he he wrote uh, a novel called Heat, which uh, in the UK was called uh, Edged Weapons. And uh, it it's set in Las Vegas, and it involves this character named Nick the Max who is a, uh, a master of, uh, combat with like simple objects. Um, and, uh, a really tough dude that you would want on your side if, if there was a problem. And he, there's this one sequence, the whole book is full of insanely meticulously dialed human moves, but this one particular action sequence, Nick, the Max takes out two armed men, himself armed with nothing but a credit card and his boots. And he does it in 18 seconds. And each paragraph of the 18, it, it, each move, each second is its own paragraph in which he meticulously describes precisely the moment that he kicks out the one guy's kneecap with his steel toed boot uh, as the other guy starts to reach for his gun and then swipes the credit card uh, uh, which had been sharpened along one edge right above the eyebrows of the second guy. So as the first guy's gun is disgorging into the ground as his kneecap caves in, the other guy's blood is just beginning its gush into his eyes, blinding him. And the way this thing is so succinctly dialed, you go, holy shit. If this actually happened, it would happen like this. And I can't believe the the rigor that you put into this and how completely in the moment emotionally you are with this guy doing this stuff and how every physical act reveals character as opposed to disposing with character conveniently for a moment to do some action stuff and then plugging your person back in that the that the violence plays completely from his perspective in that sense or, you know, with, with a complete uh, understanding of who this man is as he's doing these things. That's fucking textbook masterpiece work. I, I've read his work. I've never read that book, but I'm going to now. Yeah, it's a motherfucker, dude. Um, <laughs> yeah, it really, really is. It, it also really dissects the, the addiction of gambling in, in the most heart wrenching uh, action, there, there's an action sequence set at a at a poker table, and um, and it's just it, it's as grueling as any action scene I've ever written in. It's just a guy sitting at a table losing his money. So yeah, that that guy that guy knows how to write. Well, it's immediately going on my Amazon list, and I'm yeah. sure a lot of people listening will be picking it up as well. I, I would love to see uh, people read that book. I, I think it's it's a real gem. 
Yeah, if it wasn't rude to type while we've got a guest on, I'd literally be adding it to my <laughs> list right now. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, didn't know that etiquette ever came into your vocabulary, Dan. <laughs> I am an old school English gent. Oh, I've been in. <laughs> listen, listen to Bob laughing. He heard the outtakes at the start. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he knows you or something. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> So we have a question via our Patreon from Max Booth, and he wants to hear a little bit about your experience working on Nightmare on Elm Street Dream Child. And after that, he also wants to know a little bit about the novelization of Fright Night. Well, okay. Um, I documented... My experience on uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child, uh, in a documentary film called Never Sleep Again, The Elm Street Legacy. It's a four-hour documentary on the entire Elm Street series, uh, co-directed by uh, Andrew Cash, who... Let me put it to you this way. Nightmare 5 was, was, a, was a shitty experience. Uh, it was not one that I enjoyed, and, and I'm not proud of the movie. Uh, uh, I, I'm you know, weirdly deeply ashamed that I helped sink a, that, that my name was attached to something that helped sink a, a, an awesome franchise. And yeah, I, I mean, I've told this story a million times. I, I recommend you, you, you look up the, the documentary. The, it was so amazing when, uh, when Andrew and, and Dan Ferens, uh called me up and asked me if I would come in and talk about Nightmare 5. I said, can I tell the truth? And they said, sure. So I went in and I did. And, uh, I would say the only really good thing that came out of the experience of Nightmare 5 for me, in which we wrote a script, had it uh, taken away from us, and then, you know, six writers and 13 drafts later, they had the piece of shit they actually released with one line of our dialogue left and enough of our ideas left to steal for Nightmare 6 where we couldn't threaten them with legal action. The only good thing that came out of the whole thing was meeting Andrew Cash, who I've been directing films with ever since. And that is such a good thing that finally... Uh, the shit sandwich called Nightmare on Elm Street 5, uh, The Dream Child, uh, has, a, has a happy ending. And as for the novelization of Fright Night, that was just a, a, a little thing that happened back in 1994. No, 1984, Craig Spector and I finished uh, The Light at the End and, and uh, uh, managed to sell it to Bantam Books. It would not be released for another year and a half in 1986. They were waiting for the right moment and and I guess they found it because we sold a million copies, and that was really cool. But in the year and a half while we were waiting for Light at the End to come out, our agent said, we need to get you some work and uh, make you a little money and uh, make us a little money. And uh, so they they sent us into the novelization pool, which uh, was was pretty deep at that point. And the two scripts we were offered were The Bride which wound up being the film with Sting in it that nobody watches, and uh, and the other was Fright Night. We were kind of interested in The Bride because it was so different from what we were doing, but the people who did The Bride took one look at our uh, at the light at the end and said, no way. Uh, so Fright Night it was. And so we got the script, and uh, then we begged uh, the studio for photographs stills because they had they had actually shot the film so that we would know what the monster effects looked like and everything as it turns out they look pretty damn cool and uh they arranged for us to talk with with tom holland for about 10 minutes but that was mostly just hi how are you um the the real thing that assisted was looking at the pictures um and we had one month to write it we were paid a, a, a nice uh, amount to do so um, that was really like Craig's hardcore uh, uh, writing lesson because up until then he didn't even own a typewriter. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we burned it down in a month. It was fun. We got paid. The movie came out. The movie's fun. Again, one of these things with a really long tail on it. The, the sweet part for me now is that 30 years later, when we did Clown Town, Tom Holland, the writer-director of Fright Night, plays the, the clown with no name, the old uh, clown in the bar that gives them advice. Very cool. Isn't that crazy? Very crazy. <laughs> and, and uh, yeah, we, we did uh, 
this was the 30th anniversary of Fright Night, the motion picture. So he was showing at a bunch of festivals. And uh, at one of them, the second annual Bruce Campbell Horror Film Fest in uh, Chicago, um, that was where Tales of Halloween was premiering. And um, so Fright Night and Tales of Halloween were on the same bill. And Clown Town was ready. So I, I called Tom and said, hey, man, check out Clown Town. It's done. And he looked at it and said, man, this is wonderful. Uh, and we both agreed that it would be cool to play it with Fright Night. So, uh, so Clown Town and Fright Night were a double bill in Chicago. And, that was, and, and he pulled me up on, on stage and, and we hung out for a bit. He's just sweet, sweet dude. Love Tom. And what kind of reception did you get to Clown Town? Oh, people laughed their asses off. Yeah, it was really fun to see it in front of a crowd and just uh, and people were just like, (laughs) when the blood hits the ceiling, everybody kind of shit. (laughs) Well, I know you you said uh, it was being looked at by Adult Swim and if not Adult Swim, then there are a load of other markets potentially for Clown Town. So I wondered how far along are you in terms of that process? Ah, oh, man, a lot of people, uh, th- there are various people looking at it and various people about to look at it. And yeah, I can't even tell you who who, who has or hasn't looked at it at this point. Um, but it was definitely made with an Adult Swim type network uh, in mind or with that, that angle of programming as Comedy Central could do. But I mean, now we've got uh, Netflix and Amazon and a million other streaming services uh, burgeoning. Um, and we'll just, it, it is a, a new market that we are just beginning to crack. And, uh, uh, yeah, I wish I could tell you anything more concrete, but I ain't got it. Mm. And in terms of the Nightmare on Elm Street question, so it sounds like, just to kind of emphasize that anyone who wants to find out more should immediately go out and watch a copy of Never Sleep Again. I, I uh, heartily recommend that. And again, if you can get the actual DVD or Blu-ray that has the uh, extended features, uh, there's like another whole movie's worth of, of scenes that they cut because they have like a like 100,000 hours of, of interviews with all these people. It's an exhaustive, incredible thing that, that Andrew and Dan did and, and the whole team. Um, and yeah, I get to see, say, I'm funnier on the special features than I am in the actual movie, but the, the point gets across. Um, and I believe it's on Netflix. Ah, okay. Brilliant. Yeah, so it, it, should be, uh, it should be easy to find for anyone. And it's really, really good. I mean, you, you want to talk about an exhaustive uh, uh, documentary uh, chronicling a series that runs for four hours and moves like a rocket? I mean, it... it this is not a slow doc. This is just so packed that it's four hours can barely contain it. And it's like really in, entertaining. And it's an awesome film. It's, it's an awesome editing job and, and research job. It's, it's extraordinary. And am I right in thinking that that was when you first kind of sparked a relationship with Andrew and started making films together after that? that that's absolutely correct. Uh, at the... At the big release party at Dark Delicacies in Burbank, um, which was so huge that we had to fill two buildings with just the uh, all the people from all the films who were there. At the end, uh, we reconvened at this local bar named Champs, and uh, we're drinking and stuff, and they have pool tables. And Andrew said, uh, man, I want to talk with you about something. And I said, well, let's shoot some, some pool. And in the process, he said, you know, you got to understand, I, I've been reading your books since I was in high school and I, I really love your work and I just really love to work with you on something. And, uh, and now we do. It was as simple as that. Andrew's a brilliant editor. I mean, uh, he, 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 he cuts for uh, DC's Legends of, the, uh, Le- Legends of Tomorrow series and uh, just came off the flash. Uh, companies all over town are constantly calling him in to do stuff. But he's, he's also a very, very talented director. And uh, so I come in on the writing end. He comes in on the post end with the editing and the actual cutting and, and comping and uh, laying in of the sound and, and, uh, and uh, the effects and so forth. And we meet in the middle with the directing in uh, planning out every single shot that we're going to do 
and uh, and figuring out how best to approach it. It's great to work with an editor because he knows what will cut and what won't. So you don't shoot stuff that you don't need. You won't shoot stuff that you wind up just throwing away anyway. Uh, and there's no time to waste on a, on a fucking micro budget shoot like like we've always done. Um, so we'll actually go to the location where we're going to, to shoot this. And uh, a couple of us and cell phones, we will enact all of the action that we're going to do. We'll go back to his place and cut that and go, okay, here's all we need. So that when we se- show up on the actual set, we're only getting what we need. We're moving at lightning speed. Nobody on the crew is standing around waiting for us to make decisions because we've already made them. And if something fucks up and we have to modify, we modify on the spot and everybody's on it and we jump on it. That's how we can get incredible amounts of stuff done in, in, in a day or a couple of days. Our, our scene for this mean for Tales of Halloween, this means war. We had two days to shoot it with all that fight scene layout and building the lawns and everything. It was, it was nuts. We shot Clown Town in three days. We shot uh, 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 Stay at Home Dad in three days. We shot uh, uh, our wraparounds for Monsterland in one day. We shot Hot Rod Worm in one day. No, two days. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's that's how we work and, and love working with Andrew. He's just amazing, amazing guy. Our whole team is, is, is fantastic. We, we have a film family now where just about every single thing that we could possibly want done, we got somebody who knows how to do it and is fun to work with and, and kicks, kicks ass on it. So we're, we're in a really nice spot. It's a really nice place to be. Well, Stay at Home Dad felt like a, me- a meeting of bizarro and weird fiction, but at the same time was both and neither. And before we got on the air, Bob and I were talking about the difference between bizarro and weird fiction. And I wondered, from your point of view, I mean, what is the difference between bizarro and weird fiction? And is it a difference that you're particularly concerned about? Or, you know, are you just more concerned about obviously making a great story and something that's going to engage the reader or the viewer. I was making weird shit before either of those terms were in vogue in their per- current incarnations. Um, and yeah, I remember when, when uh, Carlton Milk the third and, and Rose called up and just said, we're thinking of, of, of calling what we're doing bizarro and starting a, a new genre with it. What do you think? And I said, I, I think it's great. Uh, I think it's a, I think hilarious names for movements uh, are always their own reward. And uh, yeah, you guys really are doing something different. But um, I mean, what are the differences? I think this is a, this is a conversation that's just really starting to come into its own. And I think it's a very worthwhile conversation. Um, That said, I also feel like, I think mostly the difference is what party you're at. You know, if you're hanging out with a bunch of weird uh, uh, fiction guys who identify as such, um, um, that's the word you're going to hear buzzed around. And if you're like the stray bizarro in that crowd, um, uh, you'll probably have people asking you interesting questions. Opposite uh, tack, I mean, uh, uh, Michael Griffin's been coming to uh, uh, Bizarro Con and hanging out, and uh, and you know, uh, uh, Ross Lockhart of, of Word Horde uh, also there. Uh, they're they're definitely surfing more the the weird fiction side of it, but we sure have a lot of fun together. And I, I you know, I feel like in some ways, here are a couple of things uh, that that have been discussed. Um, one is that in a lot of weird fiction, the fiction kind of starts out feeling normal, and then you are gradually informed that the universe is is kind of spinning out from under you. Whereas in Bizarro, a lot of times it starts out fucking weird and then just gets weirder. Uh, so, you know, at no point is it even pretending that shit was normal to begin with. But that's kind of when you, you're putting them on the opposite poles. I, I feel that there's a lot of stuff where those lines are, are indistinguishable and completely unimportant. Uh, the, the other thing that often would be said is that... Um, uh, Weird fiction might tend to be more uh, uh, more serious and uh, more um, literate in the uh, sense of more schooled. 
And uh, whereas uh, Bizarro might be described as like more uh, fun or wackier or kookier, I, I sort of feel like um, Bizarro is weird fiction with the color saturation turned way the fuck up. Um, so the, the, the colors are brighter and crazier. But again, th these are all quicksilvery definitions that squiggle through your fingers on a case by case basis, depending on, you know, what you're talking with and to whom. And it's hair splitting, but it's, it's a, it's a completely understandable hair splitting that we have only begun to see the beginnings of. Did, did that help at all? Does that make any sense? Yeah, it makes a great deal of sense. And definitely. I thought it was a very complete answer. So thank you. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, you know, uh, figuring this out is a work in progress, but I think, I think it is in progress. And I'll tell you what, um, if all of these amplifications of weirdness uh, continue to poke holes in the normosphere, I'm completely cool with it. And yeah, I rest my case. Yeah, and I think these days we're seeing a lot of crossover in... I guess the broad genre that you would just call dark fiction anyway. So, I mean, it's actually quite hard to put a lot of the best novels and the best stories into a neat genre category. And I don't think I'd want to either. I mean, that's what, that's what fucking fungasm is all about. It is like, Hey, you see these dissolving lines, let's dissolve them some more. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm mostly interested in the shit that that defies categorization, and and uh, and yanks at the at at the normosphere. Um, I'm actually writing right now. One of the next Fungasm books uh, is a book I'm working on with a wonderful woman named Heather Drain, who um, writes for the Dangerous Mind um, uh, website and uh, has her own uh, crazy uh, blog and and has written for Video Watchdog, et cetera, et cetera. And she's a real champion of fringe film, uh, real outsider stuff. And so we're doing the Bizarro Encyclopedia of Film. And um, what we're doing is, if Bizarro is the literary equivalent of the cult section in a really cool video store, uh, then what else would be in that video store and how much Bizarro was spilling off of the cult shelves into every other shelf. Um, so we're breaking down Bizarro science fiction, Bizarro horror, Bizarro fantasy, Bizarro musicals, uh, Bizarro documentaries, Bizarro porn, uh, Bizarro drama, Bizarro comedy, um, uh, Bizarro action, and uh, uh, Bizarro foreign and art house. And... Um, just basically in sort of the same way that I did the giant list at the back of art of horrible people, um, uh, indexing the films in each section of the video store, uh, and what makes them bizarro and, and how that relates, because I feel like that makes the larger argument for the term and its cultural importance and also helps explain, you know, where the fuck do you put eternal sunshine of the spotless mind in, in the video store? You know, they probably put it in drama, but it's very much a speculative fiction, but it's also a comedy, but it's also an art house film. Um, it's the one thing I can tell you, it's bizarro as fuck. And that, I think, can also help clarify the lines. And I'm, I'm hoping will help make bizarro more of a household name uh, for for uh, for film lovers as well. And this is how we uh, subvert and interpenetrate the culture. I think Bizarro and the musical go hand in hand, so... Oh, hell yes. Oh, hell yes. From Rocky Horror Picture Show to uh, Forbidden Zone to Phantom of the Paradise to Hedwig and the Angry Inch to Little Shop of Horrors to um, um, anything that has a singing animal. Uh, <laughs> oh, children's <laughs> films. I mean, children's films are, are just inextricably Bizarro. Uh, and, you know, we, we walk in. Dr. Seuss was fucking Bizarro Godfather. You know, Lewis Carroll, Bizarro Godfather. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I, I'm doing the, the children's section breakdown right now. And really outside of naturalistic old yeller or, uh, uh, you know, gentle Ben kinds of things, most of it's pretty fucking Bizarro. H.R. Puff and stuff, Lidsville. 
Oh, dude, man, that's bizarro as shit. I'll, you just add weed. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. And, and I love it. You know, I, I mean, I, I love that. I always love the weird shit. I always will. Um, yeah, I, I would say, if anything, um, I, I'm more on the bizarro side than, than the new weird side because I like to have, uh, because I like a lot of laughs. And uh, bizarro can get dark as fuck. But, um, but uh, it, it seems like raucous laughter. Uh, on the bizarro side is a is a lot more welcome and and fun uh it, it just it maybe takes itself a little less seriously so back on book of the dead 1989 oh. yes yeah uh you anthologized a lot of great writers uh ramsey campbell joe lansdale stephen king amongst them um mm -hmm. what was it like kind of working with such big names did you uh have you got any like cool stories about them? Do you encounter any egos? You know, what, what was it like to work with, with these guys? This all came about because one day we got a phone call from George Romero. Uh, our agents told us he was about to call. Um, he wanted to call because he wanted to make a film version of uh, uh, the first Skip Inspector novel, The Light at the End. And I'm losing my mind because... Romero's just completely one of my art heroes and, and had been since I was 13 years old and had uh, my first acid flashback uh, watching Night of the Living Dead in a theater and, uh, you know, thought it was a documentary. Um, and, yeah, just love him. <laughs> <laughs> just love this guy and, and uh, really feel like he, he's a, a great social horror filmmaker and, and storyteller and, and obviously uh, his his stories have influenced uh, generations. But so he calls up and we're talking with him on the phone and talking about the movie and, and how it would be to shoot in New York and blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden I get this flash and I go, so George, we know all these horror friends who um, these great writers who, who love your movies almost as much as I do. What if we did an anthology of, what else was happening in the world um, when the dead started getting up and, and eating their next door neighbors? And he said, well, you know, I don't think anybody would give a shit, but as long as you didn't use any characters or uh, scenes from the movies, then Richard Rubenstein, my produ production partner, wouldn't sue you. And, uh, and so, you know, if you want to try, good luck. And uh, if you actually pull it off, I will eat my hat. So we did. We knew all these writers. We, uh, you know, Scow and, and Lansdale and Ramsey and uh, uh, a bunch of these other cats and uh, knew that Stephen King was good friends with, with Romero and had worked together on Creepshow and, and so forth. And so sent him a letter and asked him if he would do a story. Two weeks later, I get this postcard back from, from Steve. Um, it has... Uh, a bunch of like natives in uh, the jungle carrying an enormous uh, grasshopper uh, on a spit, like they were carrying a, 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 a steer or something. And he says, you have made me an offer. I can't refuse. I'm almost done with the story. Uh, should be ready in about a week. Uh, I uh, uh, hope you would like to see it. And, um, and the answer of course was yes. And uh, a week later, as promised uh, King's story showed up. And uh, we had one brief uh, phone conversation in which uh, mostly I learned. It was very, very pleasant, super fun. He's a great guy. And we discussed how we both thought that Texas Chainsaw Massacre was one of the most fucked up, scary things we'd ever seen. And he informed me that there were these hot dogs that had chili packed into them. And if you put them in the microwave, they exploded. So those were the two big takeaways from the, from the King story. <laughs> Um, but yeah, super nice guy. No, no ego at all. Not, 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 nothing even close. Everybody was just so happy to do it because it had never been done before. There had never been any post Romero zombie fiction published, uh, unless you include the novelizations of, of Night of the Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead, neither of which were, were good. And so the idea was, what if we got some like really good writers to, to do this? I bet some shit will happen and some shit happened. And uh, then we did it again with Still Dead, which I think is a, a deeper 
the, the first book is like this insane blowout party and just mayhem in us and and we sold a ton of copies and uh and shit i mean that's where modern zombie fiction got invented was in that laboratory with those guys everybody was super super happy to do it nobody pulled any attitude there, there, there was not a there was not a set there was not a speck of dick in that except for all the dicks that get bit off in the stories <laughs> <laughs> And, um, do you, and as one of the, you know, one of the godfathers of zombie fiction, then how do you see the uh, the subgenre as it is today? Well, I mean, it's it's uh, you know, it's it's blown so completely out there that it barely registers anymore, and that, that I think it's fascinating. We we went from it took us twenty years because we're really really slow, but from nineteen eighty nine to to the actual zombie boom with the rising and World War Z and and stuff. It just shows how slow we are as a species. But once we get uh, once we get the the memo, uh, now you know everybody and his dog's brother uh, is writing zombie fiction, and that means that there's some really really good stuff. And just you know like waves and waves of barely written libertarian wet dream fantasies where uh, um, people just get to shoot anybody who disagrees with them and go, I am king of the world and then get their eyeballs bit out. So, you know, I mean, uh, there, there's, there's a lot of not so great stuff out there. Uh, and then there's some really brilliant stuff. And, uh, um, my only real regret is that, uh, Romero isn't getting paid royalties on all of it. Mm. I'd say that is one of the real, uh, tragedies of the story isn't there in fact whilst we're on the subject of romero there's a question that i've been meaning to ask and maybe listeners can uh kind of maybe tweet us or email michael with the answer ages ago i saw a book on the shelf okay it's about like um kind of the history of the making of the film night of the living dead and for the life of me i can't remember the title i can't find it on google anyone knows oh, the answer it's are you talking about please the, the zombies that ate Pittsburgh? Is that the one you're talking about? Oh, that that doesn't really ring a bell, but it's kind of almost like the oral history of the making of the film. I I can't remember who wrote it. I just remember seeing it and thinking, "Oh shit, I need to buy that." But I didn't have any money at the time. This is a couple of years back now, <laughs> and I haven't seen it since. It's driving me absolutely mad. Fair enough. I'll I'll tell you. Um, there have been various things written about it. Again, I mean, Night of the Living Dead is just you know talk talk about a story. Um, you know, none of those, all of those guys got hosed. All of those guys got hosed on the money, but um, they created a, a legendary thing. And so that story has been told in, in multiple places. I highly recommend uh, The Zombies Who Ate Pittsburgh because it it, uh, it runs not just the, the, a lot of oral history on, on the original film, but on Dawn of the Dead and, as I recall, into today. Um, and, you know, that's the trilogy. And then years later came the other ones. I happen to be a fan of the other ones. I think Land of the Dead is really cool. I think Diary of the Dead is fascinating. Uh, the very last one, it's such an odd film, but it does have a handful of his most beautiful images ever. The, the, dead, the, the dead woman on the horse and the very, very last shot against the moon. I mean, th these are probably the most gorgeous images that George ever delivered. So... I'm so glad that he's still at it. I just love that guy. He's he's such a such a we are so lucky to have him. Yeah, definitely. All right, great. I'll make a note of that book anyway. Thanks for that. Maybe sure. it's uh, it'll fill the hole that I've been trying to you know, the book shaped hole that I've had for quite a while. It's been driving yeah, yeah, me absolutely yeah. crazy. <laughs> And I'll tell you, man, if you if you find out the name of the one that you're thinking of that uh, that I don't know, I would love to know that too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no worries. I definitely will. I'm on a need to know basis. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I might send a message to David James Keaton because that guy is an encyclopedia of zombies and film trivia and obscure. Thing. So I reckon if anyone knows the name of the book, Dan, it could well be David James Keaton. Yeah, it's a good shout it. as well. Yeah. And, and my gal, have Heather Drain, man, she's no slouch. Mondo Heather is the name of her website. And uh, yeah, we're, we're having a super fun time putting this encyclopedia together. Oh, yeah. Well, if you know, if you can put together an encyclopedia of film from a bizarro perspective... 
You've got to know a lot. <laughs> you really have. Um, we consider it a public service. And we thank <laughs> you for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to shift gears a little bit and ask if you could go back and give advice to your 18-year-old self, what would it be? Oh, jeez. Wow. Take a shower. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Uh, oh, dude. You know, if I could actually go back and talk to my 18-year-old self, uh, I would have so much to say and I would avoid so many ridiculous mistakes that I've spent my entire life making. But then God knows what sort of life I would have had. I, I, I sort of feel like the mistakes define us as much as anything. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that, uh, it was precisely the, precisely the combination of, of brilliant and stupid decisions I made and, uh, and situations I stumbled into that resulted in the miraculous fact that 59 years later, I am still somehow stumbling across this earth. Uh, I, I didn't think I was going to make it to 30 because I've lived pretty wild and, and, and great kind of hard. Um, but, uh, if I make it another year, I will have officially lapped my expectations. And I, I, I find that absolutely fascinating. Um, and, uh, so yeah, I guess what I would really, if I could only say one thing to the 18 year old, it would be like, uh, hang in there, man, it's going to get pretty interesting. All right, awesome. <laughs> and I'll ask, yeah, I'll just chip in with my last, uh, my last question as well. Um, sure. Have you, you know, you've clearly achieved kind of so much. You've spanned so many different mediums and and genres and whatnot. Uh, do you have any white whales? Is there anything that you would love to achieve that you currently haven't? Oh, um, if I die before having made at least three feature films of some quality that 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 stand out for some reason, I'm going to be really pissed. Um, and, uh, so that, that's really, uh, I say three as an arbitrary number. Um, cause again, man, I'm, I'm, I'll be 60 years old next week. I have no idea how much longer on the clock I have. Um, but, uh, I guess we're about to find out. And, and that's, you know, to me, that's the burning thing. I, I want to make, I want to make at least a couple of films, uh, that, if I saw them when I was a kid, I would go, oh, holy shit. I hope, I wish someday I could do something like that. Yeah, I just want to blow some minds. And meanwhile, just promote the amazing people that, that I can't help but promote, the, the, the fungasms and, uh, and just the other artists that I love that, yeah, just, you know, passing the torch along, man. I, I think really what it ultimately comes down to here is, uh, is passing the torch. There are all these amazing artists that inspired me. Uh, I have been lucky enough to inspire a bunch of uh, amazing new artists uh, who are now inspiring other ones. And uh, yeah, uh, at the point that uh, I won't hit the finish line, I, I'll just die on the road like everybody else. At, at a certain point, I'm just going to keel over. And uh, but I, I'm hoping like the torch left my hands, and if it didn't, that somebody uh, uh, reaches down, picks that sucker up, and and keeps running. Awesome. I think wow. it makes I, mean, I think it makes really good sense with the with the films, you know, the the little snippets and stuff that you sent us over to watch. Uh the what you, the work is quality. Thank you. And, and you, you can you can see that. You can see that in the production. And I love I love this means more. Of course, I'm a big, big Danny Gold fan. So the guy oh, does the cool. best best Vincent Price impression ever. So <laughs> Which I was kind of, I was kind of hoping. I was like, "Oh man, I'm gonna get to hear it again." But no, but that, that and that's fine. That's fine. It was it was a great little piece. I enjoyed it. Uh, it was just you know it was good to see good to see him uh, in you know in front of the camera instead of you know lately he's been doing a lot of writing with The Simpsons and stuff like that. So yes, no, he's he's a brilliant performer and and you know just funny as hell. So much fun to work with. Um, um, yeah, we we had just such a great bunch of people there that that crowd scene man all of a sudden like 60 some people showed up on our set and uh and cheered the imaginary fight that we wouldn't be able to shoot until two days later uh but 
Yeah, I mean, I mean it's, it's like Cody Goodfellas in there or something. I'm pretty sure. Oh hell yeah. yeah, yeah. Cody Goodfellas, <laughs> the guy who yells, "Fight, fight!" <laughs> a, a thing of whiskey, and his character is a homage to to Fox Harris in uh, in Repo Man, in that he has like one uh, uh, sunglass lens and one blank one. Uh, I don't know if you you're fan, fans of Repo Man. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. But yeah, the guy who has the al- dead aliens in his trunk and had a lobotomy. That's uh, who Cody Goodfellow is channeling drunk in <laughs> This Means War. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, it was a blast. And, and Jimmy Duvall, um, who plays, uh, basically, they're Boris and Dante. And Boris is like uh, the old school uh, classical horror lover. And, and Dante is the, you know, tits in a bucket, intestinal uh, churn kind of uh, uh, metal guy. And they're across the street from each other. And they just hate each other. And it all ends badly. But, um, oh, man, yeah, both of those guys were, were so beautiful. And Alyssa Dowling, who plays Dante's uh, girlfriend, and just the whole fucking crowd. Um, um, w- one of the main metal heads uh, there um, also plays Bombo the Clown in, in, uh, in Clown Town, the, the lead clown. And, uh, yeah, Caroline Williams is in there. This, this, Neil Marshall is in there. There's so many characters. It, it was... We had fun. We had two days, dude. We had two <laughs> days to shoot all of that stuff, and we were right down to the wire. But we made it. We made it in our. We made it in our twelve hours. We we didn't do fifteen hours. We didn't beat everybody to death. We made it before anybody went into overtime. So you got to be real organized to pull shit like that off. And and we were. And it, it's just. Um, yeah, it shows. It shows. It shows. It was. It was pretty slick. Mm. Whew. So much fun. Now, before we go, do you have two fiction and two non-fiction recommendations for our listeners? Ha! Huh. Ha! Huh. Well, I don't know. Let's see. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I love the, the Fungasm books. The, the last two novels that really floored me, and I've been a little under-read this year, uh, I'm mostly working on stuff or reading stuff I might publish for Fungasm, but... The two that knocked me out most were uh, Josh Mallerman's Bird Box and uh, Jeremy Robert Johnson's Skull Crack City. Um, those are the two novels that, that floored me most. Um, when I think about nonfiction shit, I want to say Stanislav Grof's Beyond the Brain. He's like a, ter- a contemporary of Terence McKenna uh, doing intense research into consciousness and um, it's a very dense read. It took me about a month to slog through. But like the fif- first 50 pages lay out the entire history of uh, psycho- psycholo- psychological study and theory, uh, you know, from Freud through Maslow and blah, 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 blah. And then it starts going into really uncharted, uh, to me, territory, uh, a lot of it involving... Uh, what happens at the point that you wake up in the womb, the point that the lights start to flicker on. We tend to think of birth. We, we, we you know, obviously we think of life. Uh, our lives began the minute uh, we rocketed out of our uh, mom's vagina, but we actually probably woke up at least like a month earlier or something. And we're, we're operating on, on, on much lower level, but still uh, operative forms of, of developing sentience uh, in there. And just talking about the fact that most of us woke up in the womb and that our first real encounter, uh, life-defining traumatic encounter, is going down the birth canal and being squeezed. And um, he goes off on this one amazing riff about how that sense of feeling powerless and trapped and squeezed uh, is where existentialism comes from and uh, <laughs> uh, and whether you uh, in wh- whether you are attracted to bodily fluids or repulsed by them uh, is determined in huge measure by that first experience and that this, strangely this, makes a lot of sense <laughs> it makes tons of sense I, I'm stunned that people don't that that I've read about this in exactly one book in the entire history of books um, so yeah, that, that shit really knocks me out. Uh, another one I, I'm, I'm going to go way, way back on 
and uh, just say uh, Alan Watts on the tab, the book on the taboo against knowing who you are, which is Alan Watts' exploration of uh, Vedanta Hindu and the notion that uh, uh, that the universe is basically a sentient uh, thing playing hide and seek with itself forever, uh, masquerading as each and every one of us, and uh, therefore. Um, there's no beginning, there's no end, and we are infinite souls. Uh, uh, manifestations of, of one big infinite soul uh, playing push me, pull you, hide and seek uh, forever and trying to keep itself entertained and guessing. Uh, to me, that's the liveliest uh, way to look at life and very, very much in sync with uh, philosophically where I stand on the whole issue. So uh, the book on the taboo against knowing who you are by Alan Watts and Beyond the Brain by Stanislav Grof are in the nonfiction section of, uh, of my head today. Yeah, I'm just having a look at the Alan Watts book, so published back in 1966, and I, I have not read it, but it looks like exactly the kind of thing that I'd love. I mean, this really does look fascinating, so I think, you know, that's another one in the Amazon <laughs> basket. Yay! Hopefully, I won't be broke by the end of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, I mean, it's all good. And I think what I particularly like about the nonfiction recommendations is obviously when we ask people what their fiction recommendations are, there are going to be some commonalities. But for nonfiction, it, it could be anything, especially because there's no guidance given when I ask the question. And I think, yeah. you know, you've knocked it out the park with those two. So thank you. Oh, thank you, man. So where can our listeners connect with you? I'm on Facebook, man. That's that's the easiest place. It really is. I, I don't really do Twitter um, very often, um, but I, I'm super easy to find. And uh, Fungasm has a website. Um, and I do a, a, the periodic blog there and can certainly be reached there. But I would say Facebook is the easiest thing. All right. And do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to leave our listeners with? Well, I would like to thank them for being cool enough to want to listen to this show. And thank you guys for being cool enough to make it. And um, I would like to thank... Uh, my breakfast tamale uh, that I'm about to finish because it will be delicious. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. What a note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, you guys, man. This was really fun. Yeah, thank yeah, you for great. spending Fine. such a lot of your morning with us. It's been absolutely fascinating and I think that our listeners are going to get an awful lot out of it. So thank you so much. Definitely. Have a great day, you guys. And and listeners, have a great day, too. All right. <laughs> have a great day. Okay, you've been listening to the This Is Horror podcast with John Skip. A quick word from our sponsors, and then back to me with some final thoughts. Journey with some of the most accomplished authors of our time as they reveal nightmares from which you may never awake. Dread, a head full of bad dreams, travels the dark passageways of the mind with 20 masters of horror, including Ray Gordon, John Everson, William Mickley, Jonathan Mayberry, and many more. Dread is new, innovative, and 100% reader-selected volume of horror. Fill your head with a lifetime of bad dreams in Dread. Available at booksellers worldwide. Get more info at graymatterpress.com. Crystal Lake Publishing and Mark Sheldon are proud to present Sarah Killian, a 30-year-old, foul-mouthed, mean-spirited single woman. Also, she's a professional serial killer. In this crime fiction thriller novel with a twisted sense of humor, Sarah works for them, trusted hierarchy of everyday murderers, a secret organization of murderers for hire. So if you're looking for a strong female lead in a book similar to the best of Dean Koontz and Jay Conrath, then look no further than Sarah Killian, serial killer for hire. Out July 29th. All right. So thank you so much for tuning in, for listening to the This Is Horror podcast. If you'd like to support the show, then the best way to do that is to head on over 
to Patreon, www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. There you can pledge just a dollar a month. So if you think the content we're putting out is equal to or more than the value of a dollar a month, I'd just love it if you could go on over there and show your support. We've got a couple of exciting episodes coming up on the This Is Horror podcast. We've got interviews with Tim Lebon and we've also got interviews with Michael Brent Collins. So do join us again for those. So, until next time, be good to one another, look after yourselves, read horror, and as always, have a great day.